Hi, my name is Benedict for Higher Hertz. In this video, we're looking at Kuasa. I actually always thought it was Kuasa, but Kuasa's Amplification VVV. I assume that's how it's pronounced. We're going to look at it a little bit differently because I like to be different. It's a guitar amp, and I've avoided doing guitar amps generally because, well, I'm not a guitarist. That's not my guitar. Uh, uh, because, well, one would expect one to be playing a guitar whilst considering guitar amps. Uh, but you know what? It's a virtual guitar amp, so we probably should be considering virtual instruments, in which case my angle on this is to say, well, okay, what's this going to be like? We use it to look at a general mix, and broadly, for those of you not interested in guitar amps, to sort of say, hey, maybe you're missing something, because at times putting things through guitar amps can really bring a uh, that you didn't expect or you wouldn't have got an another way. Here's a quick AB. Here's something I prepared earlier. And here it is without every sound put through a guitar amp. With, without, with, without. Obviously we gain a little bit more uh, perceptual level. The, the, the total levels are pretty well the same, but the, the RMS is squished, which is one of the advantages that we get out of, uh, or disadvantages that we get out of um, guitar amping or distortion. Uh, we also get a different tone and it's more it's more forward, it's more aggressive. Now again, it's not about do you like this style of music? Is this right or wrong? Is it a good mix or anything like that? But simply saying, hey, what if we did do this? And I've done this a few times, it's not unusual for me to use drive, but the way I use drive is not always the same exactly as the way other people talk about using it. And the reality is, through the 70s and early 80s, putting synths through guitar amps was incredibly common. Uh, largely because synths don't come with an amplifier built in, or if they do, they're a toy. Therefore, you had to plug them into something. Uh, and there were a few specialist keyboard amps, but they were largely designed for, um, for uh, by Roland, for Roland, electric piano type things. So Willits are type sounds. And while that was all cool, they had an impact, quite a noticeable impact, upon the sound of either analog synths or, of course, the digital faithful, the DX7. And that actually defines a lot of the sound of early synths. And so where we go trying to AB them with the instrument just on its own now, just plugged into a line input of something, we don't get the same because it's not going through an amp which is adding even if it's not meant to be, even if it's on the clean, clean channel, it's probably adding drive, body of some kind. And then if there is an amp, even if it's something that, that in guitarist terms is super, super clean, uh, like the Roland Jazz or something like that, then it's still going to be adding impact. So what we have here is a device that adds impact. Now, I've known of Kawasa for a long time. I've even swapped a word or two with Dimitri, I think his name is, the guy who plays guitar in the um, in the videos. Nice player. I'm always a bit amazed that he isn't off playing somewhere in bands, but he's not. Fair enough. He's doing this. And while I'm not a big fan of a lot of the let's put all our guitars into a virtual thing and make it easy for you, there's still a charm to, to what is done here. There will have been a picture up there of the VST version, but here we're actually going to be looking at the rack extension. Same guts, different GUI. Very much similar, but just a little bit different to fit into the, the reason paradigm and workflow. Plus, this doesn't have noise bursts. It allows me to use it fully for 30 days, whereupon I have to either own the thing or say bye-bye. Uh, that's nice. The VST allows you to use it, um, but it's going to pop in noise bursts. So win that I'm a Reason user because it allows me to show you this or let you hear this without annoying noise bursts. 
winning. Plus reason people like this channel and so, you know, reason forever. The Amplification VVV. Okay, if you're remotely in the know or actually read the, uh, the page, it drops pretty heavily that this is based around an iteration or three of uh, 5150, uh, which is of course a famous Marshall amp, most famous around the Van Halen who made a record called 5150. Um, it's considered to be released at the time the most out there full on metaliest, screamoest of amps. And I'm not gonna judge that one way or another. Obviously it appeared on a lot of records and well, Van Halen. Uh, so it's a thing of some merit. Uh, would George Benson or Earl Clue have used it? Well, I doubt that they would have sniffed at it, but it just wasn't the direction they were going. So if you're after a softer sound, while this can sort of do it, you're gonna find other tools in his arsenal, like the, uh, I think it's the Lancaster, which is more laid back. So we're gonna give you a lighter bluesy sort of thing. This is ultimately designed to get aggressive. So Quasar, been around for quite some time and he, they specialize in this. Very wisely, they've really kept everything around guitar stuff. There are pedals, they've got a range of stomps and some other bits and pieces, and there is actually a mastering tool, uh, which I don't know whether it was in VST, I thought it was in rack extension first, but it may have just been because I saw it there, who cares? I was thought it was interesting, I went down a different path, but half the time I sort of thought, ooh, ooh that looks like it's pretty cool, but I didn't actually need it. Oh, there's the Lancaster on screen, right there. I have tried it and it's nice, the, the way that all the, the Kawasa devices works is really the same. So they're the same architecture underneath. Uh, the newer ones are done under a different model, but essentially they're all kind of versions of each other. Um, that does help make them cheap. They are really pretty darn cheap. Full price is 49. I think there are often sales and blah, 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 the usual kind of stuff. But at 49 for this, I think you're getting a lot of value. Uh, and the name has been around for a long time, even if you haven't heard of them. For some odd reason, they haven't become a big name, probably because they're so focused on what they're doing that the focus is on actually getting results. And that's part of the reason why I've always liked them far more than other things. I've owned and played with quite a lot of the bigger names. And quite honestly, there was so much frou-frou, and that's one of the reasons that I prefer to do this with the, the rack extension, because the GUI is actually much nicer to work with. There's so much frou-frou on most of the other guitar amps, trying to fool you into thinking that you've got, and it's like, really, come on, does it matter, or we should be chasing is a sound. And I am never chasing cloning something. I'm not going to talk to you about how accurate this is or how perfectly I can emulate Eddie Van Halen on it because it's not relevant at all. If Eddie just happened to wander into the studio after I stopped screaming uh, and he had his stripy guitar and his 5150 with him, then we could try to do an AB and you could make a decision as to which was more Eddie Van Halen, but the reality is they're both Eddie Van Halen, so it was a moot point, it would have been a waste of everyone's time. So stay right where you are, Eddie. Uh, we'll just look at it on its merits for what it is and what it does. Good pricing. Uh, we might as well run through the, uh, the good and bad and then get into the features and then look at the way we're looking at it here. It sounds good. Again, I'm not going to be into how good is it as a guitar amp. I think it's damn fine. Listen to um, the, the guitar examples in the videos. They strike me as being very, very honest to the package where he uses pedals. He shows what's actually being used to create the sound. So I get this feeling of very honest uh, marketing there. Good thumbs up from me, obviously, on that. Um, I think the sound is good. It's as good as you know how to make it. Uh, it's easy to use, and as I said, I think the, the rack extension version is very compact and clean to use. It may not on the surface look as sexy 
as the VST, but I find that annoying. I have tried his VST versions, and you know what? I would rather the rack extension. It is a better tool. It's not as, oh, look at me, uh, but it is a better tool. It, it uses less, or it wastes less space. Who cares about pictures of mics doing this? If you can't see that in your own head with these knobs and understand it, you're not fit to be doing the work that you claim you're great at doing. So obviously I'm not gonna say go out and buy Reason because this version's better, but I do think that the GUI is more suited to the work, but whatever. But it is easy to use. And I think within its own way, it's very versatile. It would be very easy for this. And I've played with some guitar amps that just, you just can't use them for synths or whatever, because they go from zero to 13 before you've done anything. And yes, this is a, a guitar amp that's all about running at 11. Uh, but you can actually dial it back. It sometimes takes a little bit of courage to do that. But Fair is fair, because this thing was designed to run at 11. If you're after softer, maybe go look at his Lancaster. Or oh, he's got lots of others as well, but I, I have tried the Lancaster as a softer, and it's cool. It really is. Um, we have to put in some, some bads or negatives. Um, the cabs are impulses. I'm 99.9999999 recurring to infinity percent sure that they are impulse responses. I don't like impulse responses, but they do work in this situation and it's kind of the way it works. It is entirely possible that the the amp, the head stuff is done with impulse responses as well. Um, again, not a massive fan, but it's the way it works. I'm an algorithmic kind of a fellow, so my one great question, not criticism, my one great question would be like, can we have algorithmic cabs? I've made a whole video on algorithmic cabineting. Um, I like them. I, I think they're more unique and, and, and out there and freaky, but then people don't like them because they're more out there and unique and freaky and, and you can't say, I dialed up the, and, and be all self-righteous about it because you've got to dial up your own sound. But hang on, if I walked in here with a, um, with a Vox and, and put it on the floor and, and plugged in a Radio Shack amp and my $99 guitar that I bought off the internet because it looks fabulous, it's not that one, uh, then the result would be my sound and the decisions that I made with the knobs and, and what have you and where I put it and where I put the mics, that'd be mine. It'd be my sound. And that's, that's how rock and roll was born. That was how rock and roll's sort of pushed through this whole idea of there's only one sound that you're allowed to have bollocks to that. It means you ain't rock and roll. You're just a scared child. So I would love to see algorithmic cabs and I would love to see somebody put out a device, come on Kavasa, uh, I know it's a different technology for you, that actually really does that. There is one in, in Reason as an add-on to Scream, which I think is great, but I'd love to see someone really tackle that. It's neither a good nor bad of the product, I just think it's a, a thing to consider. Uh, it wouldn't be very popular, unfortunately. I'd give it rave reviews probably if it worked, but past that they'd sell two of them. Right, oh, so now let's look at the features of this device. We will grab a guitar, so here's, so no one's offended, here is a real guitar loop. That's the raw sound. I just applied a preset. I largely applied presets to all of these and just finessed them. Not because I hadn't spent time playing with it. I spent a lot of time um, playing with it on different types of sounds and what have you. But for this mix, I wanted to do it really very, very quickly. Uh, so I just grabbed a pile of presets and just changed a few things to suit the need. So yes, there's a pile of presets in there, should you feel the need. Uh, they do represent, thankfully, more the style of what's being done than giving you um, supposed namesake sounds. So we'll work our way through with this. We've got presets I've talked about. You can save and load and blah, blah, blah. It'll all be roughly the same on the VST. If you can't extrapolate, then okay, whatever. We have 
essentially three types of amp. We've got different tonal, what have you, characteristics, probably more than that, and then we've got three channels. So obviously, they can give you quite different results. That got horrifically loud, uh, and the limiter probably had to catch all of that. Uh, but this is guitar amps for you. They are very uneven creatures. That's where they're annoying, but it's also where their charm comes from. Oh, maybe here as well. Being a rack extension, you've got that one, but there's also one here. There's one somewhere else on the VST. I think it's top up here. You can find it, or RTFM. So your types, your inputs is different types or variants of the amp. No doubt they are in the um, in the RTFM. Uh, but remember, I deliberately do not read that unless I absolutely have to. And that's normally a sign of a little bit of a fail or a very complex feature. And then this is pretty normal. The guitar amps, especially high gain amps, will often have uh, inputs probably with different Z values on the resistor or something or other as to how gainy they are. So this one would be the cleaner of the lot. Obviously we've got gain. So that's our preamp gain is my understanding. Tone controls. Tone controls on guitar amps behave differently from your, your sort of classic modern EQ. They're funny things. They just kind of alter the balance of the sound rather than working as an EQ like you like. So they can seem irritating, but just look for your overall tone here, not looking for how to EQ this for the mix. Be cautious of situations like putting too much low end in. There are times, like in a video I spoke about recently, where um, Metallica's Justice record, a lot of the uh, a lot of the guitars doing the riffs are very heavy in the low end, so they they're actually filling the bass and providing a lot of great punch there. Let's not discuss the mix. I think it's a great mix in its own unique way. Uh, and then when it comes to the lead sounds, they get a lot of that thumpy murk out. So they're just broad tone controls if you're needing to be more surgical than grab an EQ, because that's what got invented EQs for. You've also then got presence. Presence is a funny one. It tends to add uh, something in the in the mids, uh, not the high mids, but somewhere in the, the one or two K, and it adds a cut, which is a kind of presence. In some sounds, it's it makes a huge difference. In others, not so much. This one, I got to say, compared to say Scream, is a fair bit milder, but I commonly find a lot of guitar amp controls a little mild and pointless and obtuse because I'm prone to coming at them from the point of view of them being like EQs or compressors or whatever and, and having, but this is just the nature of the beast. This one, I won't pretend to know exactly what it does. Obviously it adds amplification resonance. I'm not familiar particularly with the term resonance vis-a-vis -vis amplifiers. Obviously with speakers, yes. Uh, but amplifiers, but no doubt tubes resonate. Almost everything does in some way. So this allows you to have more or less of that. There is a, a change to signal. It does seem to thicken the sound a lot. So if your sound's a bit too thick, like if we want a light police or pretenders sort of thing, if we want it to get more manly, then we can add this resonance that's almost similar to that feedback control on the um, the G-Sonic tape, where tape can end up feeding back into itself. So it's just another way of adjusting how tone is working. You would need to look into if there is an explanation in the manual. Um, it would be nice, I would hope there is, but commonly there is, and then the master. I'm assuming 
that this is the master for what's driving the actual output of the amp and therefore what's going into the speakers. Um, that's commonly the case, but there are some times where I've seen these and they just seem to be a master out. But there is a global output here. If we pull this down. So you can hear that as it, go, as it gets up to um, around 10, there is no 11, uh, then we do get different behavior. The, um, the, the tubes, the virtual tubes, the pretend tubes do struggle to deliver anything with anything resembling clarity, which if you're making do metal is <laughs> exactly where you want to go. You can finesse the input. As well. So that's just changing what's hitting the front of the amplification circuitry in here. If we pull back, listen to the next channel, that is a nice sound. And everything's sort of pretty nominal. That's ugly, but it's the right kind of ugly. It's uh, the sort of thing we, we might well be hearing on um, uh, the softer part of a Neil Young Rust record. You know, it's, it's good stuff. That's the B type. These are a lot lighter. C type. So C1 gives you a, a surprisingly light amp. But this gets very, very. And this is, well. You can hear the presence come up there. So we, we've got a pretty good range there of options. So A type, B type, C type, and then inputs one, two, and three. So. I think that that's cool and that's a big part of the versatility of, of the device. We've got a couple of controls here for how the tubes behave. Bias is about where the overtones that are created. As it drives, it creates overtones. Uh, go have a look at the, um, the first video, the one for uh, soft tube saturation knob. Uh, that's a few months back. Go find that. I might pop up a picture. Uh, and that I actually show the creation of Overtones. So bias means that when it's in the center, one would assume that you were getting rather nice, clean odds. That will give you a pretty clean sound. As we go off, although maybe minus 10 is clean, again, I think RTFM, this gets louder. Generally bias will, as you add more bias, then you will tend to get a, uh, a more driven, a more ripping, uh, a more toppy uh, sort of sound, but also a lot more murk in there. And particularly, you can end up with a lot more intermodulation distortion. No, that's not Nyquist issue. Intermodulation distortion is, uh, is every guitarist's friend because you end up with those really complex, I'm not going to be able to do it here, sounds that sit in between the uh, the sounds. So that's why you can play one note on uh, a heavily driven guitar and it sounds you know, really quite nice and clean. Um, or if you're thinking with a synth, 
single note. Oh, that's nice and clean. Place two of them and there's this <laughs> kind of judder. That's intermodulation. Uh, so bias will tend to uh, to increase the amount of that that is uh, is going on. Sag is ideally a thing that we don't want inside tubes, but it just means that they behave less less linearly, less well behaved. Again, if you're looking for, and I'm no master of this at all, again, if you're looking for a, um, a pretty at this and you can lose a lot of precision with, with your sag. If you're like, oh, it's a bit too polite, I need this to be muddy and mucky and, um, and too laid back for everyone, man, then sag it. Uh, that's that's my point of view. A, a true guitarist, I'm happy to hear uh, from you. Not judgy stuff, but just you know, broad. This is kind of what you would do with it. There are some functional tools up, tools up here. As you've seen, there's a global output here as well. We've got a limiter, so we can stop this from getting excitable. It's be interesting. You can hear that. <laughs> So it's got a, the limit has ended up with a sound of its own, fair enough, compared to it uh, getting the, the, the stuff through, the, the mastering here. Uh, there's filters. So we can clean up the low end. So let's have a look here and see if we can sort of see what it does. Not that it matters. Okay, it tells us its range. Up to 1k. That's fair enough. I mean, we don't really want this to be doing full-on duties, but that does make for pretty cool sound, I gotta say. And then we can roll down to 1K as well. Something that I've noticed on the um, VST version, but I haven't noticed here, is um, oversampling, but oversampling somehow seems to be more important in VST land than it is in Reason land. Um, I've got no judgment one way or another. I'm just using my ears and yep, sounds cool. I'm happy enough with that. There is also a gate, which is pretty irrelevant with synths, but you can... use it creatively if you so desire. So if you feel like your, your sound is getting too washy, you can improve the, shall we say, picking fullness of your guitarist with gates. Not as great as having a guitarist who really is very pickful, um, but it can help Otherwise, yeah, you can just use it to get rid of noise, which if you have a real guitar, you'll know all of that. Now, that's the top half. That's the head or the amplifier, the thing that takes in your guitar, makes it louder. A lower tone also comes from our speakers and you get two speakers with mic options here. So for the moment, no speaker. Ooh, that's a bit. But it's still kind of a good sound in its own way. We turn on this. There's kind of like a lot of cool stuff going on in there. So this is nice because it means that if you have something else that you prefer to do, uh, like I will often end up doing my own cabinety stuff. Again, there's a video on it with those wonderful $99 guitars. No, I didn't buy one. I did buy a $199 guitar once and uh, that was interesting. Uh, I threw red paint at it, it looked great. Uh, but the guitar sound is a lot of speaker and to some extent microphone sound. So you bring in a speaker Put that gate on just to tighten things a little bit.
and we've got mic choices. So in terms of speakers, we've got the Sheffield 112 inch driver, combo 50, two 12s, oversized 50, which is a pair of 12s, a heavy 50 for 12s, you can hear it quite a bit more, and then a heavy ultra. So <laughs> you really can get a lot of difference out of there. Oops, wrong one. Let's just pull these back a little bit. So we're going to get different tones, great. Some of them not as much a difference as others, but there is a difference. Obviously the Sheffield is the, shall we say, the cleanest, or the lightest of the lot. You then got these microphone choices, so uh, SM57 no doubt, 201, 201, sounds a bit heavier. Sounds almost like it's lacking in the in the heavies. Let's give it a heavy. Again, I assume that these are um, IRs of these microphones. Um, they are what they are. They do provide tone differences, and that's cool. We can reverse the phase. So there are two reasons for doing that. One is if within your mix, your guitar just feels like it sits outside the mix, you reverse phase, you can pull it into the mix. That's assuming that phase is the issue. It could be something else entirely, but that is a thing to consider. But it's more when you're running a pair of cabs against each other, you can reverse the phase of one of them. Normally you would do that because you didn't know what phase your mics were and you put them together and you go, okay, I'll flip this and that and oh, now I've got this, the sound that I want. There's no right or wrong answer here. The phase will have a lot more impact or a different impact depending upon level of cabinets. You've got mic angle, so you can put it at an angle to the cabinet, so it's pointing on an angle or pointing straight in. You'll tend to get a, a tighter, brighter sound with it pointing straight in and a, um, and a, a warmer, uh, crunchier sound, assuming there's crunch there, uh, warmer, less detailed sound when it's on an angle. Again, there's no right or wrong look for the tone that you're hoping for. You can then change the axis of the mic. So from quite tight to flubby. And if you're looking for a real flubby sound, then that's the way you'd go. So we could be coming in on three and Lots of bars, lots of sag. Yep. And we've got a really <laughs> meaty, meaty sound there. So the more you spend time with this, the more you understand how it works. A, a seasoned guitarist 
although many seasoned guitarists are very poor at amping, uh, or a seasoned recording engineer who has worked with guitars a lot, and I will not pretend this because I'm not a recording engineer. I never actually enjoyed the recording bit, better when someone else does it. Uh, but they will know a lot about this kind of stuff. Uh, but the best way, and the only way, is to actually sit down, as you hear I'm doing here, just work your way around and go, okay, that's the result that I get here. But it's never as one dimensional as we say. See how I said here, oh, okay, we, we add flub. But then we end up with different results in different situations. So axis is, is changing how it, how it rotates. It is easier to see on the VST. That's one advantage of the, the, the very pretty GUI. But the thing is, there's a fair amount of suck it and see when it comes to recording. It is a case of having done this over and over that your brain fills up with these possible configurations. So simply reading a book and going, well, you do that and you do that, you're not really getting there. So spend time as I am here with just this one sound until your brain starts to go, oh, I see now, here are the patterns. You're looking to fill your brain with lots of patterns. So when you encounter something and you go, hmm, now this guitar sound, I'm looking for this kind of feel. You ask your brain, you're asking that spreadsheet. The spreadsheet will go, well, I had some of it here in that cell and some of it in that cell. And it'll know, and you'll find you'll just go, yep, okay, I'll do that and that, and I'll move to this, and no, no, not that one, that one, and that's exactly what you were looking for, or close enough for knife fighting. So the thing is, don't go with this idea that there is a right way of doing it. Uh, you want to you wanna get out there and fail with it. Distance. Or change, as in we're putting air between the front of our, our cab, our speaker, and our microphone that's listening to it. So it's just like you get bassier sound in headphones, and the further you move away from your speakers, the more sound dies off and diminishes, which means you alter your tone. While tempting to say, oh, well, I've always got to get the most... There's a lot of advantage in having a distance tone as well. Uh, in the real world, and I don't know how much, if any, this emulates that, because again, I think it may be IRs. Uh, in the real world, you would actually be getting room come in there as well. So if you've got room inside your guitar mics, uh, then that can be a wonderful thing, just as room in the drum room makes those drums bigger, a little bit of room in your guitar mics makes your guitar seem so much more majestic. Now you can pan your two devices. While many of the presets have it done this way, and it's nice and dramatic, this is not Tipton and Downing. It's not the Twin Axe attack. To do the Twin Axe attack, you would be doing either one or two cabs set up to get the sound you want. Let's say that's the sound I want for Tipton. And then when I'm mixing, I would be using my mixing pan knob. So let's say it was that here. It'd be over there. Then Downing, who has a whole other guitar and a whole other amplifier, and possibly even a different set of microphones in his cabinet, will set up his sound, and it'll be over there. And when you hear the two of them come together, then you've got Tipton and Downing. Then you've got a Twin Axe attack, which is what you're hearing here. Except, well, that's not a guitar at all. Shocking! But that's how you do twin axe attacks. You do not do twin axe attacks or the, the panned hard left and right guitar sound by making one recording, let alone recording, copying that recording all the way through. Uh, 
and then going, oh, well, I'll clone it and put different cabs on or something like that. No, you need two performances. Two performances in the same cab, maybe, but two performances and different cabs, different amps, different sounds uh, is, is really the way to go. That's how the Tipton and Downing thing is done. That's how Iron Maiden do it. I mean, they go on stage with how many guitarists? Was it three or four of them? Uh, so they can get that for real. So don't go cutting corners. That's your cabinet section. So it's a head and cabinets with a lot of versatility. Fair enough. Great. So now back to our mix. So we'll work our way through the mix. Oh, we are running a reverb, which is Hertz multiplier. We'll leave that in. So here, this one was tricky. I gotta say this one was tricky to find a point at which I could get uh, something that wasn't brutally high gain, uh, but to be expected. <laughs> While we traded off a fair amount of um, bottom end, we have brought right up. Remember, I'll pop the graphic up again, that when you mix, you mix in the middle. You don't mix right out on the extremes. So this has brought that right up into the middle. And so it gives the drums a lot more heft and punch. And Again, doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong, but that is kind of good. I didn't go with the speakers because they just didn't sound remotely real. They did sound like a drum kit put through speakers, which you might do for effect, but it didn't feel a remotely okay. And that is to be expected. Absolutely no faulting um, Kawasa on that one because they did deliver exactly what I would expect if I put a drum kit through a loudspeaker. It's gonna sound that way. But with a bit of care, I was able to really push that kit right forward and give it a nice big sound in a certain sort of a way. Bass. I know this is a guitar amp, but what the? It happens. I didn't want to go too hard on this because of the rest of the piece. Again, we could go for umphier sort of sounds, but While it sort of seems impressive, I don't think that it's really winning in terms of the mix. You can hear how that fits in a lot nicer and it's lifting the, the, the sound, the punch of that bass up higher where it's easier to get it onto small speakers. While tempting to be very bassy, it's better to have that actually up in the mix, so. Here's the difference. Sounds great in the solo, but that sits in the mix far better. The um, the I brought the bus together with um, BPB's uh, saturator. Uh, there, there are other things I would normally use, but I just sort of thought, you know, we're made doing everything with drive. There was no realistic way I felt, and I didn't try it, so I could be wrong, but I didn't feel like there was a realistic way I could put that through another guitar <laughs> amp and actually come out with anything remotely useful. So I used Saturator um, and was pleased with the results. It's pulling everything together. Now we've played with this one already. Now we got this one. Somebody asked a 
quite a while ago where I was um, showing uh, something and mixing with one of my own pieces, which was synth guitars. Uh, they asked, how'd you do it? Well, like this. I tend to use a guitar plus strong. And then it's a case of working out as much as possible what I'm going to do to have it play remotely like a guitar. And if people are expecting to hear a certain thing, that's what they'll think they're hearing. Is it realistic? Well, no, not really. But that's part of why I've anchored it with a real guitar. So they're hearing one real one that's a bit different. Um, you can do it with synth waveforms, but they're not as effective as doing it with a car plus strong. So a car plus strong is a plucked string, physical modeling type thing. It's pure math, and it just works out that if we were to go bing, then this is how the wave would propagate. And this is not a bad version of that. Uh, you will see that there's a certain amount of... Because if we don't filter, doesn't sound very nice. So we've got random gain here, which is just taking each of the, the partials and putting a tiny amount of randomness to it. And every time a note hits, it changes position. So, so it stops that machine gun effect or minimizes a machine gun effect. And going through a uh, Moog style ladder just to help set up our tone. There is a little bit of finesse and it all depends on how you want that sound to articulate. You can't realistically get a synth sound to articulate in every way that a real guitarist can. It's just not doable. So either make multiple sounds that has a range of one articulation or a range across two, and that sort of largely has to be it. So that's a little bit more muted and a little bit more open. That's basically it. I did put a fair amount of compression on here because um, I was doing a lot of gain at one stage and that helps give you a higher gain sound, even though it's not louder, it's just because the signal is far more leveled at uh, and a little tiny bit of pre-drive because, and I shall show you this, this is an important part of the bigger picture here. Let's say I grab Scream. I did talk about in the uh, in the videos where um, I think it's Dimitri's showing the playing. Sorry if it's not Dimitri, some guy. Uh, then he often says, I've got this effect or pedal, uh, one of something out of their range. So that's just adding extra. like a sort of DS1 type distortion pedal or a fuzz pedal pushing into the amp. So a lot of times your amp is only part of the chain. Put a, just a drive or three in front of that and you'll be surprised at how much variety of tone, screechy, screamy, nasty sort of stuff you can get going there. Uh, and of course you can pop effects in on the front as well. My advice again is don't do it in perfect time. So experiment in your mix with whether that effect should go before your um, before your, your cab or after. Uh, a lot of times things go after and that's kind of cool but in the old days a lot of it went before and you have to be more fussy with the settings like your mixes have to be surprisingly low because obviously this is just amplifying them and flattening out the difference but you get a super super lovely sound that's very very mobile because there's all this compression and what have you going on it's a more complex signal 
But for leads, that can be difficult. You know, screaming leads, that can be difficult because you can get nasty intermodulation that you don't want in that situation where you're looking for this angelic, beautiful tone. So that's our second guitar sound. And we could, as you saw, go pretty heavy. Then we've got some synth sounds, which are very much designed to be just synth sounds. This one has, as you can hear, a delay and chorus going in. By putting them before, then we've got that interaction. Hear how that's quite samey? We're getting movement and, and different tones appearing all over the place. Nice results. And a lot of that does come through the cabinets, which are quite similar. But what's interesting is if we take So it's fusing, this is just a compositional thing, but it's because it has a guitar-y sound as well, it's fusing with the guitars, and we kind of broadly hear it as though it is one of the guitars. Sneaky clever. Then we've got this brass sound. Which does sound lovely on its own. And we have to be very, very careful with how we amp it, but we do get a nice result. Sorry, it's, it only plays for half. That's a lot of intermodulation. There is some good old Nyquist stuff happening in there as well, to be expected. Don't blame anyone for that, because we are pushing a lot of stuff right uphill there. Uh, but the point here is that we can get this nice lift. without a lot of apparent change. So I'm using this guitar amp here more like a saturator than I am anything else. So it's providing a little bit of tonal shift, but just that, that little bit of movement, the interaction, as I said, of the, the chorus and the echoes as they go through the, the head and speakers, changes that sound and just makes it seem more, more like it's really there. Uh, so that's a big takeaway here, that you can do it with saturation alone, or you can actually be doing those sorts of things with things like amps. Then we've got an FM pad. This really pulls a lot of the detail up in that sound. We could do this kind of stuff, but it's not in keeping with the piece. So I've gone with mild. But you hear how the speakers here take the gritty, screechy edge off these. So that makes that sound a lot nicer, a lot more present. You 
see the level numbers look roughly the same, broadly, uh, but it adds a lot more bite to that sound, so it pulls it right up into the mix, allowing us to keep the lower levels, otherwise we'd have to be pushing the levels stupid, and then, of course, we couldn't make anything work. Our mix wouldn't balance in the way in which we want those sounds to work. It would it would go from being too quiet to overawing the guitars uh, and everything else. And then we'd feel really upset and go turn everything else up. And next thing you know, we we're trying to run our mix at, uh, at um, plus 43 dB and trying to limit it back down again. And it's not working. So remember, we're going to pull that right up into the listenable area and we obviously want to do that in a way that works for this sound in this mix not a formula you just do that you don't put all pads at 2k <laughs> you put the ones at 2k that need to be at 2k when the mix needs them to be at 2k otherwise you put it where that pad needs to be for that mix but that's worked very very nicely to pull that bland digital sound up into the mix there is, of course, a bit of... Hertz delay, doing its delay and chorusy magic. We put it before, hear how we start to get that sort of Hammond organ sound and sort of Leslie feel. Not wrong. But it delivers a different feel and I wanted that to feel like a dx 7 e type of sound, not like a B3. So going after means that this can do its tone work and this can then do its mundification work, its, its chorusing, its delaying, without that interacting with the amp. But if we did want it to seem more like a B3, then yep, definitely put it in front, drive that sucker from there. And then we've got our lead sound, which again works through a Hertz delay. The lead. Not entirely an inspiring sound on its own. This delay is adding a certain something. And I've gone pretty heavy, very much up into, into lead territory. Uh, there are way better instances of people doing guitar leads with synths. Uh, it's, it's hard work unless you're a Good player already which I'm not and I never pretend to be uh, but we've got movement one of the the tricks again this is for the person who asked about how do you do that well some of it is vibrato because a guitarist doesn't tend to just go and stand there as synth players well not very experienced synth players are prone to doing they will pick the note, and then they will be bending that string. Not the great big whammy bar kind of thing, but they will be bending that string. And there are two ways. There's the kind of bend, and then there's the vibrato kind of thing, uh, which, of course, Dave Gilmore, Pink Floyd, is got a lovely vibrato. Now, if we wanted a more natural performance, we would probably be controlling the... Uh, the vibrato with our mod wheel but I just wanted it to be easy rather than setting it to start straight away because that's just rookie error then I've set a fair amount of delay so it doesn't come in and you will see that with guitarists they play sorry trying to get my hand in there they play and then the vibrato comes in so they might play bend and then vibrato um, all depends how good they are at doing all of those things and their feel, their touch. So that gives us movement. Without it, it's a bit not very exciting. Uh, not that this is a great thing, but just shows you the style. 
then we've got to make sure that we don't overdo it and we need to be clear on what we're doing. It's easier to say, I oh, will go to monophonic, but when you go to monophonic, it doesn't sound as good. Here it just sounds like a synth. But once we go two notes, we don't have too many notes, but with a little bit of overhang, and bear in mind this is a lot of gain, so it's gonna bring that right up. Then we get a little bit of that intermodulation as the as that happens. Which is exactly what happens on guitars, whereas the monophonic synth is going to go. doesn't have the same magic or nuance of how the player handles those transitions of notes. Obviously in the synth there's a little less sense of how we're controlling them, but if you want to you can get in there and automate this. You know, sometimes have it quite high, sometimes not. It's It all comes down to how complex your synth allows you to modulate things and how much work you want to put into it. And then, of course, our delay just adds a lot of space. So that's a really nice sense of feel in that. I'm probably going to develop this piece. Uh, whether it'll stay with the, the Kwasa or go to my very best friend's Scream, no judgment one way or another, um, because I think this Kwasa stuff's nice. I always like it when I play with it. I just love Scream. Scream's my, Scream's my jam, man. Uh, whether I could or should have something better, well, yeah. I like Scream, I get what I want from it. Uh, but if this were in my arsenal, I would use it. But I have a couple of other things in my arsenal and I found I haven't used them because I'm just a Scream kind of a guy. Uh, but in terms of what we're getting here, let's just punch these out. Obviously some level changes, but no magic. And we're getting magic. Exactly the same mix, just all those classes off. And with them in. Again, that doesn't mean that you could, should just use this on everything. It is heavy handed, um, but I'm showing you what versatility you can get from something that you might otherwise not think of using, uh, especially if you're not a guitarist. Um, but remember, early synths were commonly put through these things. Um, they were put through whatever you could use to make them louder. Uh, and you, if you spend all your money on a keyboard, then you, you probably had to piggyback yourself in with one of the guitarists, maybe the rhythm guitarist who played like a lightweight uh, because the lead guitarist was too loud. Um, so this is the way that it was commonly done and we shouldn't let go of that. While there's a lot of distortion being used, often it's not being used like this. It's just being used as splaturation, which, lacks elegance, whereas this has elegance. Whether you dig the groove or not, it has elegance compared to this. The great thing with guitar amps is that so long as you've got feel in how you play, you don't actually need to be an amazing player. I remember, um, what's his name from the Sex Pistols? Well, Steve, when they, when they started out, he really didn't know how to play. 
He didn't, he wasn't exactly Gary Moore. And when Gary Moore started out, guess what? He wasn't really Gary Moore either. Same with that guy Brian from Queen with the red guitar. He wasn't exactly Brian May when he started. So the thing is, you get out there and you start playing and you play more. I just did a mix for somebody and he ended up paying another guitarist who was a lot better, who brought a lot to the project. And I'm glad in the end that he did do it. Initially, I was a bit sort of like, you know, make the most of what you got, you know, rather than this sort of having played verse one and then copied and pasted to, to verse two, three and four, just play the whole piece. And that way you're going to get a better take. You're going to make more of what you do. Yes, your guitar playing is blunt, but it's yours. Um, and fair enough, we benefited, his song benefited overall with the extra care and attention, but his song would have benefited with the extra care and attention of him just believing in himself more uh, and playing the whole song through rather than cutting corners. Adding something like this, well, don't do it, as I said right from the beginning, don't do it to think that adding this is going to turn you into Van Halen. It's not. It just gives you the, the opportunity to have a sound. But I strongly say pick one cab, one one thing that you have. So let's say this one. It's one of the nice things with, with this, and I don't mean the 360. He has a 360, which means that you could take all his models and interchange them through the one unit. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's a mix engineer's wet dream, sort of. Um, but get your head and cabinet, just like, you know, I've got a cab sitting over there under that thing, uh, and that's it. Uh, that's, that's your sound. You just keep playing with that. And if you're like, oh, but I don't sound like Van Halen, the, the issue is, A, are you meant to sound like Van Halen, or are you meant to sound like, um... Um, 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 Dave Murray from uh, Iron Maiden, beautiful player, really beautiful player. People don't appreciate how nice he is because of the, you know, the, the amount of noise that's going on. But he is the he's the center of that band, in terms of riffs. Um, or are you a George Benson? Do, 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 find out what you are, or are you like an Ian Curtis who wanted to not play guitar in Joy Division, but everyone else is like, no, buddy, you have to because you, your playing is just, it was weird. That Be that. Allow yourself to be that. Just get your, your one box that you put yourself through and just keep playing and playing and playing and playing and playing. And if you are either a synthesis or a mix engineer or a synthesis who's doubling as a mix engineer because you're not ready to commit to having a mix engineer, then pick something, as I've picked Scream, uh, and then commit yourself to it. This is a high gain amp, so it's not the first thing that I recommend for people, but if you're thinking, yeah, like, I want to go hardcore, you have seen how it, on channel one, does give you a lot more flexibility to be versatile. You can always decrease what you're sending it in the first place, and then handle, balance up your levels on the way back out because you've got a volume knob here, a volume knob here, sort of a volume knob there, but that's part of how the amp sound. And then you've got a volume knob there, and oh, God forbid, you've got a volume knob here, and if you've got a proper mixing desk, then it's got a big-ass gain knob on the front of it. Failing that, you put in a doohickey here that um, is going to behave something like this, and you go, more, less, and you're set. Nothing to do with saying you have to set it to certain, but just set it to a workable level and you will be good. All right, I like the device. I do, I really do. Um, it's versatile. It sounds good. Uh, and particularly in the, um, the rack extension format, it's got a nice focused GUI. Yes, the GUI is prettier in the VST version. Thank you. Uh, and you can see the mics move backwards and forwards. But if that's what you're chasing, then you're probably not using this. You're not using your ears. You're not using your feelings. When you're mixing, you're just sort of going and well, that looks a bit dubious, doesn't it? Uh, but that's kind of related to what's happening if you're using your eyes like this. If you have any questions about this material, not please about Kawasa or how to, how to play their things or whatever that is for them. Um, I assume their support's okay. Uh, but if you have questions, hit subscribe and then ask your question on down below. Once I see it, I will be happy enough to give you the kind of answer that I can. If you are a guitar picking kind of a dude, I'd be happy to hear your, your take on this, so long as it's in terms of adding to the discussion, not just kind of 
dumping because dumping doesn't benefit anybody. Speaking of, I got invited into a song, uh, songwriting round table kind of thing. You present your song um, and, uh, and people give critique on it. Now, critique means that you are going to say, yeah, I like that bit, that bit, <laughs> that bit's not working out. And uh, within the first two comments that I'd made, which were actually on the admin because it wasn't a very busy group, I commented on one of his pieces. You know, the notes were okay. They all seemed to be where they needed to be. Um, the, in some ways, it wasn't entirely my place to judge that. I'm judging it as a mix engineer. I'm always open about that. Uh, but the thing was, there were three or four samples. They were, they were nice enough samples. Um, but he'd not done anything to mix them. He thought he'd done something to mix them, but there was no room. Somebody else had pointed out, hey, buddy, you probably want to bring in a room. And he'd been like, oh, yes, that's nice advice, blah, blah, blah. And I pointed out in my usual direct kind of way, hey, look, your notes are good. I like where you're going. It seems very fitting with what with what you're trying to achieve here, but hey, we really want to put together a room here. Otherwise, it gets a bit hard to to listen because I was finding that I was wandering away by halfway through because he's got these sounds that are all kind of not related to each other. He gives me a bollocking and basically goes, "Oh well, you know, everybody hears it differently." It's like, hang on, that's not a discussion group. That's just somebody being a spank. And then he'd got three or four posts in a row about um, you know, this software, which honestly I think is stupid for making your headphones sound either like a completely different room. You know, I can have Abbey Road with uh, Sir George Martin farting in the background and turn my headphones into that. And I just think what a steaming pile of, well, that's what I think it is. And I suggested to him, seeing he was obviously struggling with it, not getting the results that he thought that he could, should, would, I suggested the old way of doing it, which is A, don't mix in cans, and B, this is how you learn to reference your system so that you can work. And I copped a bollocking from him for that. It's like, how dare I, oh, that's old fashioned, dude. It's like, well, you know what? A lot of kids are listening to old records. You know, you go into, in Australia, JB Hi-Fi, and there's Bad out of Hell on vinyl. It's like $50, buy it on CD for $9. <laughs> People are buying this stuff. The kids are buying this stuff. Why? Because they're realising that it's kind of better. Not because I'm addicted to vinyl. I've got lots of vinyl and it's all down there and it's all been turned into MP3s. But a lot of these old records aren't getting pulled out by kids because they're going, oh my God, there is more magic in there, in there than there is in this um, plagiarism at the disco kind of stuff. Well, that's all very... It's like moving the mics on the GUI. It's it's not making it any better. Uh, they they're going and listening to these older records at some stage, and they're going. I mean, my daughter, she sends me something. Oh, here's another song from Plagiarism at the Disco, and I'm like, okay, this is what he's ripped off, and she's like, oh wow. <laughs> it's like, yeah, because there is this extra depth. So being old fashioned and being modern. Being modern doesn't make you any better, especially if it makes you a sucker. So with discussion, discussion has to be open and it has to add value. So yes, I'd love to hear from guitarists or 20 guitarists on how they feel about this, but not to say that software sucks because that's not a discussion. That's just, well, that's just dumping a steaming pile. I have expressed some pretty direct and polarized or polarizing opinions here, but I do explain them and I'm happy to explain them even more if requested. Most important thing, get your amp cab of choice and spend some time with it. Just pick certain different types of sounds and spend time, time, time seeing how, if I do this, what happens? That way you spill out your spreadsheet with lots of little ideas of what happens when you do this, when you do that. And whilst you're doing it, have fun.